The Art of Being Ruled. Wyndham Lewis. Original Publication 1926. 1989 Edition. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Part 11. Proudhon and Rousseau. Chapter 13. Democratic Freedom and the Caste Community. I am very aware that what we regard as the ancient and valuable liberties of Europe are not lightly to be put aside. But it is as well to examine of what exactly they have consisted, and to whom they have belonged in the past. They would be found in most cases to be the lumber and old rubbish accumulated by the sham fight of the conservative Liberal Party system. They are largely the dummy artillery employed by the staffs manning the Liberal Opera Bouffe parliamentary barricades. While such revolutionary aristocrats as Byron or Shelley were writing melodious verses about liberty on the Riviera, millions of people were plunged in misery everywhere, especially in France, as a result of its great revolution, which was the principal source of poetic inspiration for wealthy Englishmen for the first half of the 19th century. A slave is apt to be better kept than a penniless freeman, with no political right except to read, for a penny, the stirring speeches of gilded demagogues of luxurious habits, engaged in verbal sparring with another team got up in the Tory colors. The sickening thud of their words is the only distraction that such a person has, very often, and the chance of a free ride on election day. Liberty is manufactured with words, all our struggles are about words, for no one would fight for reality, since without a name they would not be able to recognize it. Freedom was the name of a square in Aristotle's ideal city. In that square it was intended that the select band of ruling elders and the magistrates should exercise themselves daily in suitable gymnastics. Here is how this square is referred to, politics, 12. Adjoining this there ought to be a great square, like that which in Thessaly they call the square of freedom into which no low mechanic or husbandman or any such person should be permitted to enter. There are many places today that no low mechanic is encouraged to enter, only, they are not called squares of freedom with the same insolent frankness, nor is a necessitous mechanic called a slave. He is called Mr. Everyman, and his rulers try and sell him a toothbrush or a bassinet. When he is compelled to kill other mechanics of neighboring states for certain well-defined purposes, of which he is completely, indeed blissfully, ignorant, with bombs and shells, he is described as a volunteer. That part of the earth on which he has had the misfortune to be born is called his country, which is as though you called the Ritz his hotel. And now that at last there is a real antagonism and cleavage between groups of his rulers, socialism takes the place of the milder liberalism, that, too, is his. All is done for him. These are the common places of democratic rule. Can this poor man be the loser has he anything to lose? By his rulers shedding the Pequikian masks, the socialist noses, the kindly liberal twinkles of the European egalitarian masquerade, and appearing as men and women very like himself, only luckier, resolved, just as he would be in their shoes, to keep him firmly in the gutter, and treat him, as he knows he would treat them, like a dog? Only, without exaggeration at all, understanding indeed the case, as a dog he will be better treated than as that troublesome and embarrassing thing, a man. So why not waive the little word and accept the status of a dog, or of a slave, since there are such heavy penalties attached to being called a man? Even a dog may sometimes bite the hand that feeds it too kindly, and the lethal chamber at the vets is more humane than the shellshock sanatorium. And whether you call it war, with Napoleon, or revolution, with Sorel, the penalty is too heavy now for the use of that word, man. Words, however, certainly make people happy, it could be objected. And there is no limit to the disparity that is allowed between a word and a fact, the fact may quite well be on another world, that is the secret of the success of the otherworldliness of the original Christian heaven. This is a considerable objection to an open, highly organized, state despotism but the very absolute nature of their material loss, once the despotism had been imposed on them, would persuade people to cease from seeking always outside themselves objects of happiness. They would be thrown back on their own resources, and discover, it is to be hoped, their own reality. The truly childish objects of the contemporary Europeans' desires, all the toys provided for the spoilt, softened, democratic mind, could not fail to give place to truer satisfactions. Even the fact that eventually the political order indicated above must lead to the establishment of a caste system does not seem a misfortune, once the caste system is there. Most people not only must be, but enjoy being, the proverbial fishes, fowls, or herrings, and today they are suspended in the void, as some sort of democratic abstraction, the history of which Sorel has sketched in such a masterly fashion. They have no real taste for abstraction at all, and hence none for democracy. For there is nothing wrong with democracy except the people who compose it. How would the caste system be built up? It would no doubt ensue from the more and more rigid establishment of vocational tests on the American pattern, which are already being introduced into Europe. 
This will probably develop into an examination system on Chinese lines. This caste system would then be entirely built on faculties or gifts, not on what we roughly call character, and certainly animal physique would become negligible. That small fact alone and it is an important one would modify an entire set of things that still have some influence today. But we have reached the point at which two types of life are strikingly contrasted, the traditional European life, large, rough and ready, free and easy, haphazard, violent, and wasteful, and another in which personal bluff and bluster, often attractive and with a good if frantically wasteful thing to its credit, will count far less. Luck is the enemy of the new system. In a rigid caste system there is a minimum of luck, of the events dear to the heart of the gambler, of fluke and fortune. Its object, ideally, is to eliminate this element of luck, so kind to one person, the lucky dog, and so oppressive to the rest. How many people today, not because they are in any way remarkable, or indeed of the faintest interest to anyone except themselves, who are often the least gifted, meanest, and most ridiculous of their kind simply because they are lucky, possess wealth and consequently social satisfactions of all sorts. It is that meaningless inequality, so offensive to any intelligent person, that would be done away with by such a system as is in view today. We have also to some extent reached a point at which we can see all the possibilities of human life, so far as it is to be physically constant and intellectually constant. That should enable us to interrupt the old Riedernell described by Proudhon, to overcome the charm of the circle. If only we arrive at describing the fashionable circle quickly enough, we should virtually possess all its successive phases simultaneously. That point we have almost if not quite reached. Out of the integral impression we should construct our new political equilibrium.